Grand Bonita Village case, uh, don't be here. Um, you can leave because this is the only thing we will be handling here today, uh, the Bonita Village case. Let make sure I'm right on that. Okay. Um, at this time, because we know some people uh, do want to uh, go to work and we know some of you have scheduling issues, uh, those people who cannot stay for the case who would like to testify earlier uh, rather than later, uh, they can proceed before we start the case and we're opening the record at this time. Very good and just uh, one more reminder for those that may have come in late, please double check your cell phones, make sure they're turned off please and thank you. Okay, uh, do we have somebody for public record that wishes to come forward? And remember, please, uh, excuse me, for the record, this is Roger Brunswick. How do you spell that? B-R-U-N-S-W-I-C-K. And your name, ma'am, is? Martha. Uh, Martha. Oh. Please raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you provide is the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Amen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Please state your name. <laughs> Martha, M-A-R-T-H-A, -A, Simons, S-I-M-O-N-S. Thank you, Chairman Brunswick. And first, let me remember Frank Lyles, who's not here, who's currently having heart surgery. Had open heart surgery yesterday. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody, and, please uh, pray for Frank. Yeah. Think about Frank. Um, much of the delight, probably, of um, Ms. Montgomery here is I'm actually here to support this. What a surprise, a huh? First. No, it's not really a first, but um, listen, our comp plan says, and many times you've heard me say this, that we should be doing infill development west of I-75. This is one of those times that we can do that. Um, I've been here to oppose development east of 75, but I thought it'd be good to come down and actually support something that I think that'll be good for our city. Um, we've oftentimes talked about what would be good for the Bonita Beach Road corridor on the west end, um, restaurants, dining. Of course, we've got the beach there, and people want to come and see our beach. Um, I read through the packet. I see they've knocked back uh, the amount of rooms from 480 to 390. I think that actually works for, you know, what the, probably the traffic counts are there. And I know we're looking at that Bonita Beach Road corridor study, visioning study about possibly changing um, the design of how Bonita Beach Road works. So this will contribute to that, um, you know, making it more beautiful, uh, more walking friendly, bike friendly. Um, I think this can be one of those resources. The other thing is, as your former city council representative to the Tourist Development Council, I like tourist development and I like tourist development dollars. And there's a lot of dollars that will be coming in from this project, probably about $4 million a year. That's, that, that's significant. That's really significant. The other thing is um, I also liked addressing, I know a time ago somebody um, came to the city council, not, I don't think it was before us, but they talked to us individually, somebody who lives here in town, um, talking about creating a parking lot with a beach shuttle. Well, this owner proposes to do that. And I think that's really smart because we know how hard it is to get back and forth to the beach and here they are, they're gonna help address the trips problem with having a shuttle to the beach, to shopping, to other areas in town. Frankly, you know, usually public money is used to create circulator buses and they're willing to do that with private money. Um, as a person who also zoned this property, this front property back when I was on city council, um, I thought it was a little bit much to have 60,000 square feet of commercial. I'm, I'm glad to see that knocked back to 23. I think that's a plus because that reduces the amount of trips that'll be there. And I guess the last thing I want to say is um, the buildings that are in the back there um, that are already existing provide a buffer already to the residential um, neighborhood. And I know, um, you know, some of the things that people complain about are noise, traffic, light. Well, of course, they've got to follow our dark skies lighting, so I'm really happy about that. And so light intrusion shouldn't be a problem. Um, as far as noise goes, those buildings provide sort of a buffer themselves for what could happen up on Benita Beach Road. If anything, I see they're going to have pretty lush landscaping, which is what we like in Benita, being a tree city. And uh, the last thing is the traffic. I think he's addressing that 
um, through the various, you know, complementary um, uh, shuttle being supportive of the design of Benita Beach Road Visioning Study. I think that, the, and reducing the amount of uh, square footage and the amount of rooms. I think those have all been addressed. Is that good? That was excellent. <laughs> She's surprised. But anyhow, I think this would be very good for our city and I look forward to hearing your discussion. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simons. Hello, my name's Dan Spriggs. Would you spell that please, Dan? D-A-N-S-P-R-I-G-G-S. -G -G Thank you. All right, so I live in Southwest Florida. I'm a Hertz employee. Um, this has, however, not always been the case. Um, like most employees, I, I relocated down here in Southwest Florida. However, I'm not just like all Hertz employees. My grandparents uh, uh, moved down here about 18 years ago. So I've been visiting this location for some time. Um, I remember driving through Estero when it was nothing but cow pastures um, on the way to come to Benita Beach. Um, the development that has been made over the years is astronomical. Um, I also remember sitting on Benita Beach at Doc's Beach House actually um, to rent jet skis when I received a message from my, my wife that my, um, uh, she was pregnant with my son. Now he's six years old and now he gets to enjoy Benita Beach uh, just about any time he wants. So I left the northern states and I've always loved this place and I've always I've enjoyed seeing it grow over the years. Um, when I left my old home to take the job with Hertz, I passed up numerous opportunities um, in cities like Raleigh, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Orlando, and Tampa. So not, I didn't just pass those opportunities up because of what Hertz provided me, but um, I chose this place through the development and the growth and the potential that, that I think this town offers. I think that this place is one of the most beautiful places on the earth. I believe the projects like this at Benita Village will add to the attractiveness of this town. And I can assure you that others will make this place their home, see the real future this town has with the development projects and um, discover more opportunities and activities for their families, just like I did. So I'm in favor of this project. I recommend the zoning board votes in favor of it as well. Thank you for your comments. Do I have anybody else that needs to get to work or? off and wants to just and if you would please in order of saving time just uh would you all get in the center stand in line in the center aisle and as uh when she this young lady is finished then we'll take the next speaker and yes ma'am your I, name pat morris p-a-t-m-o-r-r-i-s i live oh, off oh, i need to swear you in i'm sorry oh, oh. as well as the I live off of Vanderbilt Beach, uh, Vanderbilt Drive, not far from the intersection of Bonita Beach Road. And I think that this development would be a great asset to the community. And it would certainly bring a lot more our way out Bonita Beach Road that way. That's all. I That's do. good. Thank you. Did, and did, uh, with the interruption, did you spell your last name? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, Thank did you. Did you get that? Gentlemen, please come up. Why don't you both come up and she'll swear both of you in at uh, the same time. For the record, this is Roger Brunswick. Thank you. Um, do you swear or affirm testimony you provide today? Yes. Hi, good morning. Uh, first of all, I just want to say my name is Mark Willard. That's with a K. Uh, and then Willard, W-I-L-L-A-R-D. I currently live in North Naples, uh, Bay Forest area. I think everybody knows where Royal uh, Scoop is, ice cream place. I kind of live right next to there. Um, but I also run two small businesses, uh, Mary Maids uh, in Naples, Florida. And we have the territory from Marco Island all the way up to part of Estero. And I also run another company that we started recently, which is called AaronFamily.com. And I want to say, uh, Excuse me, what was the name of that? Errand Family, like E R R A N D, family.com. It's a concierge service business. Thank you. Uh, I want to say that I am for the new project that the developers are proposing. Uh, Benita is currently one of my clients, and we do have some challenges 
as a small business, and I think most people in Naples and Benita understand that, season versus unseason. We can see the season in the traffic. As soon as October starts, it starts picking up, and as soon as May after Easter, it slows down. After Easter, our business almost gets cut in half. So what that does for our employees is they starve for hours. Uh, we try to find anything that we can to give them more hours. AaronFamily.com uh, was in the Naples Daily News, and it was for giving more hours to our employees. We're doing everything we can. Uh, Benita, since we currently have Benita as a client, they've increased our business by about 8% just from what we currently are doing right now uh, on the cleaning side and the AaronFamily.com. Most of my peers in the summer are either flatlined or redlined in the summer. However, we are expecting a really, really big season, but the summer is not what people focus on. The small businesses obviously need to focus on that for growth. This new project would continue to help us grow. Um, Benita Village has obviously increased us about the 8%. Um, and on behalf of my employees and myself, uh, we want to thank Benita Village for the continued op opportunity and the partnership that we have currently. Um, this project will help us continue to fill the gap and help us grow in the off season. A lot of our employees are extremely poor. Uh, no, no one really knows how poor they are until you work with them. When they are cleaning some of the units and the leftover food that they have, they will take the half empty peanut butter jar home for their family uh, to, so they don't have to buy groceries. This project is gonna definitely help us uh, or anybody else that, that takes this project on to help the service industry. Um, I just wanna say that this is a major positive for the service industry. Uh, we'd be very excited and I know our employees would be very excited to be a part of this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, sir. Morning, my name is Rudy Jamarco, G-I-A-M-M-A-R-C-O. Thank you. Uh, I live directly behind Benita Village, uh, intersection of Quails Walk and, Benita, and uh, Meadowlark Lane. Uh, I own a couple of properties back there. I've been down here for 25 years. I actually thought something like this was gonna happen a long time ago. Um, I think we're in need of it. It will beautify the city. Um, I see nothing but good for it. I'm all for it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Sir, please step forward and raise your right hand to be sworn in. Sir, firm testimony you provide to the public nothing but the Thank you, sir. My name is James McCune, M C C U N E. I'm just a local resident here and I think this project will be fantastic for the people. Uh, the combination of the hotel, the commercial buildings and the condominiums, I think it is a good blend for everyone in the area. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, sir. Is there anybody else in the room that wishes to speak because they have a need to get off to work or else, uh, elsewhere? Seeing none, uh, then uh, I will ask uh, council to uh, proceed or, right? Uh, yes, this time we'll swear in uh, Ms. Montgomery's witnesses. Ms. Montgomery, could you please introduce uh, your team and then I will have the city also do so um, at this time. Okay, Neil Montgomery for the record. Uh, to my right is our planning expert, Wayne Arnold, architect Ray Pizeskin, our economist, Russ Wire, Tom Runyon, is with the applicant, Omer Drawer is the applicant, Ted Treese is a transportation consultant, behind Ted is Kim Shalaka, an environmental consultant, and to the right of Ted is Brent Addison, engineer. And Sharon Umpenauer is here too, but I don't think she wants to talk, but uh, that's the extent of our witnesses. Madam Attorney, do we need spelling of those names? Uh, we might, but let me, I think a lot of those names we can easily get for the record, um, and I believe some of the package materials have it. Uh, Mr. Arnold, you've been previously tendered as an expert in land use and planning, correct? Uh, well, hang on, hang on. 
this is Neil, we will give you a copy of the PowerPoint which has their names. So that way, they'll all be spelled. We'll give that to, to the clerk. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wire, you've been here before, and I know you have congratulations on changing your company, but you uh, um, are an expert in uh, econometrics. Okay. And uh, Mr. Pazakian? Pazakian, I, I apologize. Um, have you testified here no, before? No, I have not. Okay, we'll probably do a small voir dire of you if you would come up here. <coughs> Everybody else had to go through it, so today's your day. That's all right. Please raise your right hand. I have it. Do you swear a firm testimony you provide truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay, before we start, I'm providing the clerk with a copy of your resume. And if she could provide one to the board also. Uh, Please state your full name and spell your last name. My name is Ray, R-E-Y, Pezeshkan, P-E-Z-E-S-H-K-A-N. And you are an architect by trade? No, I'm no. not. I apologize. And you are te um, will be tendered as an expert in? in uh, I have an architectural firm, which is PK Studio. We are an uh, expert in uh, planning and architecture. Okay. And we are um, representing as far as the, for doing the master planning for the project and doing some rendering and so forth as far as the buildings and the diagrams that I'm going to be showing. And you have pre prepared master plans in the past as well as this yes, one? Yes. Uh, the company that, that I own uh, is 30, almost 30 years old, and we have done master planning in southwest Florida from Charlotte all the way down to Marco. Okay. And have you testified as an expert in uh, any tribunal? I have in Lee County uh, in, uh, for uh, Hope Hospice, the uh, m big master planning for their project on Summerlin Metro Parkway. Okay. And is that project similar in nature, or you can explain why the project is similar as to your testimony? Uh, it has uh, pretty much every, is a mixed-use project, uh, is okay. re has retail component. Actually, that was a 56 acres project and they had a mixed use components, uh, Hope Hospice and medical and ACLF and the adult facilities and the uh, uh, condominium, all mixed use project. Okay, and when you testified for Lee County, what were you tendered as an expert in? As doing the planning. Uh, Ms. Montgomery, would you assist me as far as what would you like him tendered as an expert in planning? Planning and architecture. In planning and architecture, I believe at this time he could be tendered. And Audrey, this is Neil, if you would, um, I'd just like to highlight some of the projects uh, on his resume, such as the vineyards uh, in Naples, Cambria Park is a government project. So uh, you have done both residential, master plan, communities, commercial, and governmental, <coughs> is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. And so be, so be it. Here's okay, Ohio you're, you're now tendered as an expert here on this. Ohio, and you're an Ohio State graduate. That's, uh, that's <laughs> important. Ted, Ted Trish, you've been previously tendered as an expert in transportation uh, consulting, Kim Slacta in environmental planning, uh, Brent Addison in civil engineering. Um, I believe that's it for the applicant. Um, and I did have them sworn in, correct? No, we have to do oh, that right okay, now. please raise your right hands. Uh, do you swear, uh, Mr. Dorr and Mr. Runyon, if you too, um, do you swear firm testimony you provide today's truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Ms. Genson, I'm going to have the city um, also, if you will identify who will be testifying, if they could please stand. Sure, for the record, Jacqueline Genson with Community Development. With us, I have John Dolmer, a community development director who is an AICP certified planner. I also have Jay Sweet, who is a project surveyor and also an AICP planner. I have Michael Kirby, who is a certified environmental professional. And I have Tom Ross, who is our transportation engineer. And then I also have Sam Vincent, who is the city contract architect. And you yourself are an expert in planning and zoning? That's correct. Uh, if you could raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you provide today is truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, I think that's it for me for swearing people in at this time. Ms. Montgomery can proceed with her case, and the city can proceed with their case, and then I'll be back when any legal questions or swearing in. This one? And if anybody needs this? Do you want me to? You can talk to that. If any of your people need this. 
We're ready. Go ahead, Ms. Montgomery. Thank you. For the record, Neil Montgomery. I want to start off by saying I appreciate the time and the efforts that the staff has spent with us. They've spent way more time, I think, than they wanted to. And I would say that we are, uh, for the most part, we are in agreement with the staff. And one of the things that Jackie did that I really appreciate is on your staff report, she put little boxes with the language where or highlighted those areas where we disagree. So it made it very easy, I think, for the public and for everyone to understand uh, the verbiage areas where we have some disagreement. There's one area that's not in little box, and uh, Mr. Arnold will address that later. We've already gone through the list of consultants, so I think we can move past that. I want to stop with this slide for just a second because I think um, it's Would you get the lights over there? I'm sorry for interrupting. Just the I, first, I can read better when it's light. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the next one, too. There you go. A little more? Good. Sorry. What we have is an aerial with uh, the comprehensive plan land use categories identified, and I think that's important because we are in the gen the red is the general commercial, and that category permits residential, retail, and hotel uses. It specifically identifies those uses. So the uses that we're asking for are specifically identified as appropriate within this comp plan category. We're in a unique area because to the south in the area where there is no color is Collier County. Surrounding us is medium residential with both the medium residential, the high density residential you see kind of in that paler pink and the general commercial all allow a maximum height of 75 feet. The, um, the medium density permits 10 units an acre and it permits a variety of uses such as group homes, foster homes, public schools, mobile homes, and RV parks. And the high density permits 15 units an acre at the same height and the same types of uses. Along with that, I want to talk about the surrounding zoning because we have an interesting mix of zoning. You probably can't read it, but if you could, most of the area in the red is C1 zoning. C1 zoning is something you inherited from Lee County, and it was a category that essentially started back under the 1978 zoning regulations in the county. So, and you can't zone into that category anymore. So those properties have been zoned with intense commercial for over 20 years. And, and that C1 allows a broad mix of commercial uses that you wouldn't be able to get today. So all those parcels that surround us that you see with C1, CG, CT, all allow uh, very intense uses and with no special conditions imposed on them. It's a standard zoning district. So we're literally surrounded by standard zoning districts that don't have to provide any kind of special buffers or anything else. To the north is TFC2, that duplex zoning. And again, that, we don't rezone into that category anymore, typically either. The pale white property is RVPD, which is an RV park. And we also have MH zoning in that pale pink, which is mobile home zoning. So it, it's the interesting mix of uses in this location <coughs> that are permitted. The primary change here, there's two primary change. One is to increase the number of hotel units, and the other is to reduce the amount of retail. Right now, the property is approved for 40 hotel units. And one of the things I think that's important to note with hotels, because I've had the privilege of working for a lot of hotel rezonings, is if you want a good hotel, you got to have to get a flag. And if you want a flag, you have to get you know, at least up to 100, roughly 120 is a starting point number of units. And if you want to have amenities, you need to increase the number of hotel rooms beyond that. It's pretty much simple math. If you're a Hampton Inn and you're going to provide free breakfast, you have to have enough rooms essentially to make the numbers work. So it's, the more amenities, the, the more units. 
And the importance of having a flag is the city spent a lot of time uh, on their visioning, and, I, and I've looked at the PowerPoints for those visioning studies. <coughs> it's important to have a flag because a flag cares about its brand and cares about maintaining its brand, and so they, you have a better assurance that that, will, that hotel or motel will be kept up. If you have a 40-unit hotel, that's not going to be a flag. It's going to be some independent operator. It may be lovely, but I think if you look around, you know, all over the state of Florida and look at those kind of motels or hotels, that's not the character that you want here on Bonita Beach Road. The staff has come up with some unique conditions that I want to highlight because I think they're important because um, they're worried about the things that I think you folks are worried about and probably a lot of the folks are worried about. One is they have a condition regarding traffic management. One of the things that the staff is concerned about is they want to make sure that when guests come to the facility that they are they're greeted, they're ushered in, and their cars are removed so you don't end up with stacking problems on any of the roads that surround the community. So they have a condition regarding that traffic management plan. So we're going to have to submit a plan to the staff. They're going to review it. Uh, and that's going to make sure that we efficiently deal with people. And I just had the opportunity to up in Winter Park to stay at the Alford Inn, which is part of Rollins College. They have a very small area that pulls off the main road there, but they have very efficient valet parking. Uh, and so they whisk you in, take your car away, and, and during the whole time I was there, there was never any backup onto that main road. Another condition uh, that the staff has, we agree with the concept, and that's the shuttle service. What we disagree with is some of the verbiage. I think that the way the staff has the condition worded is discretionary as to whether or not we have a shuttle. Our, our language says it's mandatory. I think it's important to have a shuttle because I think one of the big concerns in season is the traffic to the beach. So having a shuttle uh, allows you to reduce the number of trips and have more people in that shuttle. You know, it allows you to go to the airport and pick people up so they don't have cars. So I think it's important because I think it limits the number of people. So um, I think the conditions should be mandatory. Our language is mandatory. So that's our difference of opinion. Uh, condition 4B is another area of disagreement, and that relates to architecture. Um, and really, I don't degree, disagree with most of it. There's one sentence that talks about uh, the void to massing. I tried to look that up. I have, and, and to date, I have no idea what that means. And I don't like conditions that I don't know what they mean. So that's my concern about that. I've asked the architect. He says he knows what it means, but it's vague. I don't like vague things. So what I've included in our language is a reference to your code, which already deals with massing. That way, I know what that means. So that, it's not that we disagree, I think, on the ultimate outcome. It's a verbiage difference. I think it's vague. I don't like vagueness. I like clear, clarity. So that's our difference there. And then the last um, area of disagreement is the proportionate share condition, which is condition 11. It's on page 22 uh, of your staff report. And again, my concern about this really relates to subparagraph F. Subparagraphs A and B are pretty much standard language that you're used to seeing, so there's no problem there. A and here's my concern. The staff references two code sections, 2-30 and 2-137. And those are fine. We agree with those. The problem is, is when you deal with proportionate share language in the code, there's more sections than that. And those other sections fully describe what we have to do as an applicant when you submit for a proportionate share development agreement. And it fully describes how things are evaluated. My concern is by not referencing all the sections and, and singling out some of them that you create a question about whether or not we have to comply with all the sections. I think it ought, we ought to be complying with all the sections regarding proportionate share and concurrency and the statute. And it's not clear to me, as it's written, that that's what's going to happen. And some of the language that we've included in subparagraph F 
is different from the code and the statute, and I don't think that's appropriate. So that's the difference there, and we can talk about that more later. But essentially, they have language that's different from the code in subparagraph F. I want to comply with the code, all of the code. And I have that with me, and you know, we can talk about it later if you want to, you know, read all those sections, part of the paper I have. But, but those are essentially the differences. So, it, it's, so we agree with staff, except on the shuttle condition. The void to massing, if you know what that is, um, I'd like to take that language out because unless somebody can tell you clearly what that is, and the proportionate share language, I think, either take out language that's inconsistent with the code or put all the code sections in, but it needs to be clear we're going to comply with all the code sections relative to concurrency and proportionate share. And I forgot to go through the rest of the slide. That's okay. <laughs> Mayor. Before you start, for the record, yeah, well, I'm just making sure that we're lined up. Um, for the record, my name's Omer Dror, uh, I'm the manager for Benita Development Company. Uh, that's O M E R D R O R D as in David. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, appreciate everyone taking the time this morning. Uh, my role here is just simply to give some overview, some general insight into how we came up with our site plan and with uh, how we came up with the thought for where we're at and why it is that I think and we think that it's the best and highest and best use for the residents of Benita Village, the residents of the uh, nearby community, the entire Benita Beach Road corridor and the city of Benita Springs. Um, so just going back a little ways, the site was accumulated around 2001. Um, it was built up in 2006, and then it was foreclosed shortly thereafter. Um, I came in in 2012 and acquired the, the land. And when I came in, the first thought we had was to sit back, uh, have as many public meetings as we could. We have had about 40 public meetings so far. Um, engage the residents of the community, go to all the local civic organizations around town, uh, go to the city, uh, city staff, find out what the needs are of the city, find out what the needs are of the residents and what the concerns are of the residents. And I'll kind of go through some of those things, um, s starting off with the residents of Benita Village. Uh, the first thing we found out in some of those meetings is a lot of frustration. And a part of that frustration, everyone in Southwest Florida lost a lot of money during the downturn in the real estate cycle. But those residents were hurt, um, were, were extra hurt by that. And the reason is, when they were originally purchased, this up here is what the site plan was. And the developer, um, if you look at the bottom part, there's a marketplace there. And that marketplace was sold, and you can see it in the next slide over what it looks like. That was sold as being a Fifth Avenue type, uh, what you would, ha it was designed after the uh, Tommy Bahama courtyard over on Third Avenue. And so these people paid a significant premium for their condos, even at the peak above and beyond what they would otherwise sell for, so they could live with extra amenities. Um, and so some of those amenities were built out, the pools were built out, but then the community went under. And that meant that left 80 owners paying a significantly higher uh, HOA fee than what they would otherwise pay. Um, I'm not sure, we host a lot of uh, events, so if any of you have been over to Benita Village, we're very proud of it, it's beautiful in the back. Um, a lot of great amenities back there. Um, the front is, is they're, they're <laughs> not so great, uh, we hope to change that. Um, but yeah, those AD owners have to pay for all of those amenities, even though they never signed up to pay for all of those mm -hmm. amenities. And so th that one of their real concerns was completing out the community. The second one was that we can't complete the community at the level of construction that was originally designed if we don't get that premium for providing extra amenities. If you just simply cut out the, red, the, the, the courtyard, which as you've seen in the last 15 years, there has been no high-end Fifth Avenue retail built up on that section of roadway, and it's just simply the rents. The rents don't warrant that. We hope to be a part of that transition, and we hope our project leads to high quality uh, retail on Bonita Beach Road, but at the time in 2012, that wasn't the option. So we asked everybody to come up and brainstorm their ideas of what type of amenities they would like, and they came up with really, really good ideas. 
and we shared those, we shared all the numbers, and then we went and we met with the city, and they had mentioned some concerns about wanting more meeting space in Bonita Springs. We met with the Chamber of Commerce. They also mentioned meeting space as being a big component that the city would like. Um, in addition to that, all <coughs> the civic organizations we met with, and f that we luckily in Benita Springs we have a lot of great philanthropic organizations, but sadly with that they can't necessarily afford to pay the Hyatt for the high-end meeting space. And so we started to host all of those events and those community meetings. And we realized that a, a great space, a great civic uh, space to host those would be great. And when we combined all those factors together, amenities that could drive higher uh, condo prices, amenities that can activate Benita Beach Road and provide the meeting space, that's where we ended up with an eco-friendly um, resort. And the reason we came up with eco-friendly, and that's the next slide over, is our current site plan, was when talking to everyone, th our community and the city as a whole, what we found is everybody comes down here because of the nature down here. They come down here to go to the beach. They don't come down here for a big city feel like a Miami or a New York. Um, what they really come down here for is to experience that small town charm, the nature that we have down here. And so we thought, how can we go ahead and, and activate that on Benita Beach Road so it's not just a dilapidated street? And what we came up with was moving all of the roadway out and leaving the entire intersection open so that when families come down, their kids can walk around the resort barefoot, not having to cross streets. That's how we came up also with the great idea. It was actually one of our residents. When we took over, we already have a shuttle right now, and it runs to the beach back and forth. And one of our residents thought, let's expand that. And looking at all the work that the city has done on, on Old 41, the idea now is that we do, we charge a very high nightly fee for parking, and we have ex increased our shuttle service. And as you heard Neil say, we're happy to make that mandatory as a part of our application. Picking people up at the airport, taking them to all the local locations like the Everglades, uh, Wonder Gardens, to Old 41, to all the historic locations, to Lover's Key, um, and really giving them a sense of place and a sense of Southwest Florida. And I think that's gonna attract the type of visitors that are gonna stay here, the type of visitors that are gonna wanna stay here and bring their families, because um, they really get to enjoy the real quality and the real uh, feeling of Southwest Florida. Another thing we were inspired by was the visioning study. So as this progress was happening, the city started mentioning their visioning project. And that really inspired us a lot. And we started thinking the complete streets, the pedestrian friendly, the bike friendly pathways. And we started making adjustments to our site plans. And I'm very thankful to everyone at city staff for all their patience with us. Uh, we've been working at this for about a year and a half now, just on the city application portion of it. We've gone through many revisions. Some of the initial ones before the visioning study came in had parking along the front. As you see, all that parking's been removed. Now, in fact, in the front, we've got a large, um, and Ray will speak more to that, but we've got a uh, park space there um, designed for as the pedestrians and the bikers uh, pass by. It gives them a nice shaded park to stop in with a cafe and some water features so they have a, a rest from their, from their path. Um, in addition to that, we've said we'll continue to work with them as they come up with, their, with the aesthetic that they would like to see. I know there's a standard set of trees that they're looking at to have. And you know we're very inspired by that also. Uh, Bonita is a Tree City USA designated city. And so we're, we've been working with the city. And Mike has mentioned to us a lot about the exotics and getting rid of all of our exotics and having native species brought in. This project's gonna be the first well-certified project in Southwest Florida. Uh, what that means is it goes well beyond um, LEED certification. So LEED certification has to do with um, sustainability. Well certification goes beyond that and has to do with health and wellness. So both the building materials that we'll be using, the air quality um, gets monitored annually uh, to make sure that the air quality is there. The open space and the green space that we use is there to enhance people's um, lifestyle and health. And there's been plenty of studies shown that people are healthier living in a well certified building. Um, and this will be the first one in Southwest Florida. And given the amount of frontage that we have on Bonita Beach Road, we really think that this is an opportunity um, to act as a catalyst and add private dollars to the public dollars that the city of Benita Springs is gonna be putting in to reactivate that road. Um, and it all starts with a great aesthetic. Um, you know, we've done, as mu we've done quite a bit, again, going back with the city in terms of uh, the height up front, uh, fitting the ballroom space that we're gonna need. Modern ballrooms are 22 feet tall. And, uh, and we just think that this will 
really drive a lot of really great development to southwest Florida, but low impact, high quality development, and that's the key, um, that really built, brings a high quality aesthetic. So that's how we came up with the concept. We think it fits with, uh, with the vision for Bonita Beach Road. We think it fits with the feeling and atmosphere of Bonita Springs. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, my name is Kim Schlachta with Boylan Environmental Consultants. Uh, my resume, and I've been previously tendered off, so that information is on file, so if you need spelling, that's been taken care of. I'm just briefly going to go through some of the environmental, um, the environmental things that we're going to discuss on this site. It's very brief. Let me see. Um, as part of the application, um, Boylan did conduct a wildlife survey and we provided a vegetation habitat map um, that overlaid the two sites, both the east and west parcel, that met the application requirements. Um, we did see Zurich Oak on site and that was something that's um, been out there for a while, but a lot of the site does have a high uh, percentage of exotics, so we have a lot of disturbance, part of it is developed so we were able to incorporate that into what the requirements were for our uh, preserve and open space. During our wildlife survey, we did find gopher tortoise burrows out there. There's quite a few. Uh, there's a history of tortoises in that area. However, um, a lot of them were focused in the areas that had not previously been cleared. There was a history with previous relocations on that site. So we did find a high number totaling 39 burrows on that site. Uh, this is a map that kind of shows our vegetation mapping, the flux map, along with some of the burr locations that we did find. As you can see, we didn't s find anything on the western parcel. Everything was focused on the east parcel and the vegetated areas. And let's see what else we want to talk about. Just a, a quick summary as part of our habitat preservation requirement, we're only required to preserve approximately three acres uh, and on this site. And, you know, we do have a limited amount of native vegetation that is existing out there. Because it is a urban corridor and this is an infill project, uh, working through that comprehensive plan policies that working with Mike Kirby um, and with staff, the applicant has been able to, you know, make a plan that will work for both for both of us and that meets the policy requirements. We're looking at reduced preserve open space so that we can actually provide a lot of that inf uh, a lot of that preserve offsite. Um, part of uh, part of that offsite mitigation for the preserve will be spoken about I think a little bit further with Wayne um, under under deviation 10 which talks about off-site mitigation for meeting that open space preserve requirement um, and also just to address with the number of tortoises on site and that that small preserve requirement that we have we're looking at an option for relocate tortoises off-site now personally I am an authorized go for tortoise agent with the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission here with the state so I'm very familiar with go for tortoise relocations and the benefit of the species. And in locations such as this in an urban corridor, infill projects, long-term viability of tortoises is not ideal. We, we'd like to see them in larger preserves and uh, tortoise habitats in areas where they can actually have a, a sustainable population. So trying to preserve them on this site specifically is not necessarily the best option. So. Again, this is something that we've looked at and we're probably going to be doing off-site relocation for the tortoises and we'll address that in more detail at the time of development order. And I think that's generally what I have to say. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Uh, we'll do that at the end of the, all of the okay. presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else? Our next witness is Ted Trish. Oh, I had it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why? <laughs> Good morning. Ted Shreesh with uh, TR Transportation Consultants. We were uh, <clears throat> responsible for preparing the traffic analysis that was uh, submitted as part of this application. I'd just briefly like to go through the, uh, the analysis that we did in working with uh, staff and the conclusions that, that we came up with uh, in our analysis. The, um, the traffic study that we prepared were, was done consistent with the current codes and regulations in, in the city of Bonita Springs and Lee County. Uh, Bonita Beach Road is a Lee County DOT roadway. So uh, we looked at the evaluation of the impact that this project will have uh, at a future build out year. We selected <coughs> 2022 in our analysis and we based it on the build out parameters that have, that have been discussed. Uh, but as you're aware that there are some existing uses on the property. So there are existing 80 uh, units on the property today. So we looked at uh, the build out of this project with the 390 total uh, hotel units, which is an increase from the 40 that are currently approved in the zoning. And we looked at the reduction uh, of the retail use has been indicated. Uh, the current approval allows for up to 60,000 square feet of retail uses. Uh, the current request is to limit that retail use to 23,000 square feet. And then we looked at the build out of the approved uh, multifamily units. Those are approved at 220 and that's going to remain at the 220 uh, threshold that's currently approved uh, in, under the existing zoning. This table, I, although the, the numbers are a little small, just basically shows a comparison of the PM peak hour and daily trip generation. The PM peak hour is the highest uh, trip generation period for this project uh, and that's typically the analysis hour that we utilize uh, during our analysis for the intersections and the roadways and so this table just shows a, a comparison of uh, the trip generation during those two periods the PMP and the daily based on the approved uh, zoning that's in that's uh, on the property today and then based on the proposed zoning that uh, is before you this morning in terms of the uses that I just mentioned. Now one thing this trip generation does not reflect uh, is the impact that that shuttle service will have on uh, the trips that will be generated by this project. As you previously heard, uh, the shuttle service is going to be a requirement uh, of the zoning. There's going to be multiple shuttles provided. Uh, right now they do have a shuttle for those 80 units and they do have some data based on uh, historical patterns that, that that shuttle and the activity that that shuttle has. And based on the historical patterns that they've had during season, uh, they saw as much as a 20 to 25 percent reduction uh, in the trips because of the use of the shuttle. So if, if you simply just apply that reduction uh, to the build out of this project, the trips that we would generate would actually be less than uh, what we would have based on our current uh, zoning approval. So uh, there is conditions in the staff report that uh, a further study will be done uh, as part of the development order process that will look more specifically at the impacts of that shuttle service. Uh, we don't typically utilize that during the zoning process because of the zoning we want to look at the worst case in terms of trip generation and impacts to the roadways. Uh, so we did not account for that reduction of that shuttle. Uh, just because we wanted to ensure that we're looking at a worst case of the impacts of this project will have uh, on the exterior roadway network. So, but at the time of development order, consistent with the, uh, the conditions that are in the staff report, uh, there'll be a further analysis done uh, once they have uh, an operator selected and, and ha have looked at other uses. As Neil indicated, there, there are many other hotel uses that utilize this type of shuttle service and doing a study that, that precisely looks at what impacts that that shuttle service will have uh, on the trip generation. And, and one of the aspects, not only reducing trips, as was indicated earlier, to the beach and so forth, but you're also reducing the parking demand at those end destination uh, locations, such as the beach or, or downtown uh, in the old 41 district. By, by utilizing the shuttle, not only are you reducing the trips, but you're also reducing the parking demand that those trips would have, they'd be looking for a parking space in those uses too. So the benefit is, uh, there's multiple benefits in providing that, that shuttle service. But again, in our analysis, we haven't specifically looked at that 
just because we don't have the empirical data yet uh, to be able to examine that. We evaluated the level of service uh, based on the conditions in 2022, and our analysis indicated that uh, Bonita Beach Road in 2022, both with and without the project, uh, will maintain a level of service C. Uh, and this is consistent, again, with the guidelines and the methodologies that we utilize and have utilized in the city in the past, as well as uh, in Lee County in looking at their information. Uh, so this project in, in the conclusions of our report is consistent with the comprehensive plan, the goals and objectives in terms of the impacts uh, that it will have. Uh, and again, included as conditions in the staff report, uh, we have to look at intersections, site-specific improvements that will be done. Uh, this project by far is not done in terms of transportation analysis that it, that it must do to proceed forward to, uh, to construction. Uh, Benita Beach Road, again, as I stated, is a Lee County road, so we'll be seeking permits. Uh, if I could just go back to the site plan real quick. This is the existing plan. Is there a laser on here, Jack? This is the existing approval. Uh, this driveway was, has yet to be built over here, but this driveway ha actually has been constructed. Uh, so this is an existing driveway, and then they have an existing driveway on Luke Street. Uh, with the new plan, you'll see that driveway closest to the traffic light has been eliminated, and then we will supplement that with this additional right in, right out uh, to Benita Beach Road over at that location. So we'll have to examine the impacts of that driveway. And this driveway will be shared with the existing restaurant use that's on the corner. Uh, so. Again, sharing access, which Lee County DOT always encourages uh, shared access. So we're not increasing the number of driveways. We're actually decreasing the driveways that were permitted from the previous approval uh, from two down to one. And that will be limited to a right in, a right out movements. The main access is obviously off a of loop, which is, has a signalized intersection. So again, conditions of the zoning uh, in the staff report and it, that will be in the in the ordinance require us to do further analysis at the time of development order uh, to determine exactly what improvements are going to be needed to that intersection, additional turn lanes. We do anticipate, and even this drawing reflects, some additional pavement on Luke Street uh, to accommodate our project trips uh, in the short segment of Luke Street between our access, the parking facility that's here, uh, and the traffic signal. So we've, we're fully anticipating that. We just don't know exactly what those are going to be yet. Uh, because we, we need to get through this process first and then proceed through the development order, recollect some traffic data during season, and evaluate those intersections based on the conditions that are present at the time that we apply for those, those permits. And, and Ted, this is Neil for the record. Uh, the staff conditions require uh, that those improvements, those intersections warranted by this project would be done as site-related improvements. Is that correct? That's correct. And just for the record, for the folks who may not know, what does that mean when it's a site-related improvement? Who pays for it? Site-related improvement means it's the full responsibility of the developer, and, he, and those improvements are not eligible for impact fee credits uh, through the city. So they're 100% the responsibility of the applicant. Thank you. And for the record, those questions were from Ms. Montgomery. <laughs> Thank you. Lean Arnold is our next witness. He's our expert in planning. Oh, Russ is next. But I don't have this slide. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Board of the Zoning here in Bonita Springs. Uh, for the record, I'm Russ Weyer, it's W-E-Y-E-R. 
Um, I'm president of the <coughs> real estate econometrics, and uh, we're a local company. And I've been uh, we we do fiscal, financial, and economic consulting for both governments, special districts, and also landowners. Uh, also, so you know, I'm a 35-year resident of Southwest Florida. Lived in the city of Benita Springs for about six years. Was with Westinghouse for 13 years, and also with Fishkind and Associates for 10 years. So been here for a while and have seen a lot of number of changes that have gone on, uh, particularly here with the city of Benita Springs. And I'm here to testify that, um, as proposed, Benita Village will be a significant contributor uh, to the city, county, and region's tax base, and also its economy, as Mrs. Simons testified earlier. I'm going to hit a few of the slides so that you see what, uh, what potential this project has on, on the city and also, again, the region and the county. First of all, uh, I want to talk about our impact fees that, that the project will uh, generate. Um, in terms of, of this project as the way it's proposed, an uh, impact fee per unit, as you can see, will generate nearly $5 million in impact fees. And one thing to understand on, on impact fees, when you set the impact fee ordinances, no matter where you do this, they don't set it at the full uh, impact. There's usually, there's a little increment that uh, uh, supplements that that comes from operations and maintenance of a general um, jurisdiction um, grants that come in and those kind of things uh, so the next slide I'm going to show you is truly the fiscal impact and that's revenues after your costs to the city over the next 20 years and it starts out and, and the reason it shows a, it is negative in the first four years and the reason that is because of the impact fees and it, that's really an anomaly because the impact fees, when they show that in this model that we utilize, um, shows the full impact and the, and the project isn't totally built at that point. So, and it's not generating those operation and maintenance revenues to offset that. Uh, ultimately, uh, by year 20, it will have contributed over $7 million uh, positive to the city after costs. The, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the real estate taxes that will be generated on an annual basis, a little over $3 million in, um, in real estate taxes. And that's based on the, the uh, average value. The other important thing to note on this is the commercial aspect is, and no matter which project you're in, the commercial aspect is always much more fiscally positive than a residential project would be. Um, they don't require the amount of services that a residential side would be. So um, that, is, that is vitally important. That's why it will be very positive for the city. Um, annual real, when you look at those annual real estate taxes, which are based on the current millage rate that, that we utilize that we took right off of the property, uh, there are a couple of areas that are, are uh, significant that stand out. Uh, to the schools will be nearly $1.5 million, and to the fire department, almost a half a million dollars annually coming from that project to the to these particular departments in terms of the uh, what I wanted to show was the tax taxes that will be generated both from the hotel and also uh, the sales tax that comes from the rentals because of the rental that will be going on there as well uh, the annual rental revenue approximately 45,000 for the condominiums and approximately 65,000 from the hotel rooms which would be the revenue generated and when you look between 2017 and 19, as it is being built, uh, it'll generate roughly $9 million in taxes. And then on an annual basis from 2020, 21, 22, 2021, and 21, 22, uh, we'll get closer to $5 million on an annual basis, which is very important to know. And that's on a 3% increase um, going forward. Uh, at completion, uh, the, the project will um, annual taxes between the real estate and the rental taxes that will be coming locally, almost $8 million. And going forward, that's going to do nothing but increase as the values and everything else increase. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the um, impact, the economic impact. Uh, this comes from these, uh, these numbers are driven by the uh, regional industrial multiplier system that comes from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the government for our region. And what this project will generate, this is during construction, we'll have 671 jobs, uh, 339 indirect jobs, which, which kind of filter out from the project itself, total impact of about 1,000 jobs going on during construction on an annual basis. Uh, and you can see the, the number of salaries and the, the output, which is the dollar rolling through the economy. At completion, 
and this will be sustainable going forward, be 371 direct jobs, indirect jobs, 130 for a total jobs of about 500 jobs. And that's pretty significant to this, to this area. And again, you can see from, from your uh, output and also from salaries, that'll be very uh, significant to the economy where the dollar again rolls through the economy. Um, final in, in my um, conclusion, the Bonita Village will generate on average about three million in annual real estate taxes. Again, almost 1.5 million to the schools and a half a million to the fire department. I will generate almost $5 million in impact fees. It will also generate almost $5 million in uh, rental hotel taxes annually and will generate 501 annual jobs at completion. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, I'm Wayne Arnold, professional planner with uh, Q Grady Minor and Associates. We're going to reload the presentation, so give us a brief moment to pull back up the original slide presentation. This is a slide that you've uh, previously seen Neil Montgomery discuss, and everything in the red highlight on this page shows the commercial land use designation, your general commercial land use category under your, your Bonita Springs comprehensive plan. So the project that's existing is entirely within your general commercial land use category. It allows specifically hotels and motel uses. It also allows multifamily dwellings up to 10 units an acre. Obviously the 220 multifamily units were previously approved and, and those are still in the mix. And we're increasing the number of hotel units to 390 units from 40. And then uh, we're reducing the uh, commercial retail down to 23,000 square feet as uh, has been previously mentioned and analyzed. You can see on the uh, aerial photograph that's depicted the 80 units that have previously been constructed. And probably one of the more significant changes that was discussed by Mr. Treesh will be the elimination of the westernmost driveway on Bonita Beach Road. And that will be replaced with uh, access, uh, the existing access on Luke Street, as well as a shared access with the Rhodes uh, restaurant further east on Bonita Beach Road. That will allow us to have an elongated turn lane on uh, Bonita Beach Road to serve the Luke Street entrance. And uh, it also will allow us to accommodate a Lee Tran stop that they anticipate having uh, to remain on the corridor. This is the existing master concept plan that's been approved for the project. Uh, you can see the area that's noted as under construction is uh, the area that's been largely developed with the 80 units. We've redesignated on the master plan an area that um, Mr. Dror now controls as TC1. That will be the area where the primary hotel and the balance of the residential units, as well as the proposed parking garage, would be located. Another parcel that's uh, TC5 parcel west of uh, Luke Street is also in the mix, and, and they are a co applicant and have uh, given up some of their commercial square footage for the project. Um, one of the things before we go there, one of the things that um, we've, we've discussed with staff on and on with this project has been the proposed building height of 75 feet. Staff has ultimately supported the 75 feet request. They have a condition that we disagree with, and that is that they've, they've proposed that any building that's within 150 feet of our northern property line would have to be no taller than 55 feet. And we disagree with that. We think that uh, with the sight line studies that we've prepared, the existing and enhanced landscape buffers that are proposed, and the building articulation, I know that Neil doesn't like the void to massing ratio discussion, but, but there will be some transitional massing elements that are a part of those buildings. And then we've also committed to some green building architecture, which you'll see in some of the architectural exhibits. So we don't believe we need an extraordinary setback condition for this. We believe that what we will show you demonstrates that we can be compatible. Keep in mind that the, the properties that are north of us, as Neil mentioned, even though they're single family residential today, they can be redeveloped up to a height of 55 feet. So what we're ultimately talking about is a height difference of 20 feet. And as you heard Mr. Dror mention, the idea to have a resort hotel with real conference space and ballroom capabilities means that we need at least 20 feet in building height. So it's accommodated in our request by really needing that first floor to be a higher lobby level than you would find in just a normal living level. Uh, keep in mind we're also currently approved at 55 feet within the community so again it's a 20 foot height increase. 
We have asked for three new deviations. Ms. Schlotka mentioned the one with regard to going off-site with the preserve that's in your packet. We also had a building separation uh, condition that's in your packet that staff supports. And then one that's not in your packet, and I can hand it out, the code technically says that if we want to go for buildings above 55 feet, we either have to ask for a variance or a deviation. So for plan development, you would ask for a deviation. So we've written a deviation request that would say that we're allowed to go beyond 55 feet to a maximum height of 75 feet. And I left it fairly generic, and I said subject to the development standards that are approved as part of this project, because I don't know if you or council are ultimately going to agree with staff on a setback or you're going to agree with us that we don't need an extraordinary setback, but whatever that is, it will be reflected in our development standards table and the conditions uh, for the project. But, um, you know, as Ms. Simons mentioned uh, earlier, you do have uh, comprehensive plan policy 1.14 in your future land use element that talks about encouraging infill development and redevelopment of sites. Certainly we think this is an infill project and because of its size, it's unique. This is almost a 20 acre parcel on Bonita Beach Road. That's hard to find. It is of a size that can be supportive of the resort, hotel and residential component that we're asking for. I don't think you're gonna find another property on Bonita Beach Road west of US 41 that's, that's same size and has the same capabilities to support what we're proposing. Again, staff finds us consistent with the comprehensive plan. We concur that we're consistent with your comprehensive plan and would urge you to find us consistent with your comprehensive plan and your findings today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ray Pezeshkan, P-E-Z-E-S-H-K-A-N. I'm glad to be here with, uh, with you to go over the, the project that we have. Uh, as I recall, 35 years ago, I used to live in Cypress Plantation in Benita. We have changed a lot. But what really what I see in this project is something that is unique and will enhance the area. We were involved with the master plan, which really uh, we were in, even involved with the original master plan of the Bonita Village. When Omer came over and talked with us as far as what we can do and talk with the neighbors and so forth, we thought that changing the concept will create better energy and so forth to the site and for the city. Uh, the site is really uh, contains as far as uh, 220 uh, condo and 390 uh, hotel units. There are existing uh, buildings that are located here and as far as the hotel units are located here and residential condos back here. Uh, the variety of the, the, the project, the buildings are from three story, two story over parking all the way up uh, higher to create some variations and so forth in heights. And we have located the parking structure which is about f a four level parking structure uh, here and the rest of the parking and so forth will be allocated outside and underneath uh, underneath this uh, this building right here underneath the buildings uh, and for this site we really what we have tried to do is provide the, the amenities that needs for uh, for the site and that really is providing all the pool areas and amenities uh, within the pool deck areas and uh, to enhance to be able to really provide the amenities to, uh, for the for the project one of the things that we uh, we talked a lot about was creating the open spaces which to the public and that open space is really from the front and by removing some of the parkings that we had in the past project concept we were able to do that to be able to bring in uh, bringing really the, the pedestrians and so forth uh, to the project. One of the elements as far as setbacks, and uh, uh, Wayne brought up as far as the heights and so forth that we're requesting, uh, what we thought that uh, the best to show that is to do a cross section of the north end of the property. Uh, and that really showed the uh, 
pretty much the uh, Quell's Walk. This is Quell's Walk uh, in the residential area and some of the houses in the back. And this, this right here shows the property line. And what we are really trying to do, there's a lot of exotic vegetation and so forth that happens in the, in the back portion of the residential area, which we are really proposing to, to uh, uh, bring them down as far as in, in our property. And by providing royal palms uh, and some uh, oak trees and different species as far as metal, we can really show uh, that as far as our view, which is really from Quell's Walk and even the back of the residential area, the maximum height of 70 feet is pretty much is going to be blocked by, by buffering, landscaping, and so forth. Uh, for example, this building right here is about 50, 50 feet high, and the setback is really about a 70 feet setback right here. So within that setback of 70 feet, we can easily cover the bufferage and so forth that covers the building height of 75 feet. One of the other things that we try to do is uh, really uh, it's to show from the Bonita Beach Road what we are really going to be seeing and so forth. So we thought we provide you a rendering as far as what we are talking about, the architecture, the different levels and so forth. Uh, for, ex for example, this, this, being, uh, this is being the hotel area that goes from three story and rises based on amenity floor and so forth, higher. And this being the, again, an entry sidewalk and uh, the other buildings that we have for residential and this area here, which is really the pool deck behind, behind this building. Uh, what we did here, we just really show a lot of the white uh, uh, white uh, buildings and so forth, but uh, as was discussed earlier, we are really trying to do enhance creating a, a living walls and so forth. And uh, by living walls meaning really creating some wall vegetations and different things in this space and, uh, and uh, providing for, to, enhance the, uh, to enhance the buildings and environment around them and pleasing to the, uh, to the, to the neighbors and so forth. This is again another rendering uh, that we're showing from Bonita Beach Road. And this pretty much shows as far as enhancing the sidewalks and the public area, that entrance to the, to the open space in, our, in the property. Uh, that it can really help, people can enhance the biking and so forth, so people can, from outside, being able to uh, uh, go back and forth between, the, between our community and, and, this, and, and, and the street. Uh, this again is another shot of the portion of the hotel as, as it, which is really on the left side and then uh, the entry, again the entry to the, to the public area of the site. Uh, and this really with landscaping and so forth, again at the time when we come in for a development order we can really talk about buildings and then the heights differences and so forth, but uh, trying to create a nice area, and this being a, such a uh, good sized piece of property frontaging uh, Bonita Beach Road, that really will, will help uh, the Bonita Beach Road and the buffering of the noise and so forth uh, definitely will enhance it. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Neil Montgomery for the record. I have a couple questions. Condition 4C says all buildings in excess of 55 feet shall incorporate living walls or similar techniques. Can you go back and show us again what exactly that means, what that condition requires? What I was saying that really the buildings that you're seeing here is why we definitely, this, these are the different techniques that can be used. For example, here, vari variation of different colors and so forth. Uh, and our parking structure is going to be a four level parking structure which by, by, the, by, by the requirements right now, we have to have four, uh, four major facades. So all those are, are going to be m major facade. And this is some of the treatments that we can use on it and so forth to kind of soften the, the mass as far as the uh, concrete and so forth. Okay, so condition 4D that says the parking structure is going to be designed with 
primary facade treatments along all four sides. That's what that means, that you're going to? Correct. The, the, it means really the parking structure has to have primary four, four facade, which really be looking at it as a front elevation requirements. And then condition 4A says all hotel and multifamily buildings are going to be designed in accordance with the LGC and attachment D, which is the graphic that you've shown us here today, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And, and that concludes our case in chief. We do reserve the right for rebuttal. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, at this time, do we want to uh, uh, have any questions from at this point? Any questions for? Yeah, we, I can either. My name is Jim Worcester, for the record. Uh, we could possibly wait till after uh, we hear the staff presentation, but specifically, I got a couple questions regarding uh, um, what you've presented. Relative to parking, a four level parking garage, how many parking spaces can you get in the, on that site in a four level parking garage? I don't know the answer to that question, someone else does, but, but I would say that there's, just for the record, that there's a parking garage, there's surface level parking, and then there are parking under other buildings on the site. So. If, if there's concern about whether there's a lack of parking, which may be where you're headed, that's not the only facility that's providing parking. I, I, I understand that, and uh, but I just like to sort of add up in my head what all, where all you're going to have parking. And I, Ray, Ray is going to respond okay. to that. Uh, the parking garage has four levels. It, right. it, will, it will contain about approximately plus or minus 350 parking once it's designed okay and in addition to that the parking for the additional um, 120 units 100 the, the new units you're going to build to the east kind of many units where's the parking for that going to be let me go over and i kind of explain where all, right, good, all the parking you. could be the existing is existing project has a over uh, i believe 11 parkings right now uh, but what we are really proposing is we're going to have some surface parking out here for, for convenience and so forth. But major some of the rest of the parking is going to be underneath this building, which is here. By putting parking just underneath these buildings, not really in the center, we can reach easily the parking requirements that we need. Okay, underneath the buildings, that's going to be lower than the grade level? No, no, it will be what it will be. It will be really the, on, on grade, the deck, the, the pool decks and so forth is going to be raised and so forth uh, to be accommodated. So Ray, just, just for clarity's sake, everything that I see on the east side in beige is elevated. And so that whole area, there's parking underneath. Uh, all, all these buildings have really parking underneath uh, underneath them, the existing buildings. All these buildings will have parking underneath. For example, this, this portion of the building, which is really here, will have parkings that, that can enter and exit here. Uh, this, right, right in this area, there will be enough parking to handle that building, and the same thing here. So that's, that's how we are getting the parking for underneath the buildings. Okay, so th th those buildings to the right, the new, the new condos, are limited to 55 foot in height. Uh, you're, is that that's what's planned? 75 feet. S 75 feet on those to the north. They they can vary as far as from two uh, three story all the way up. Uh, we are proposing to be uh, 75 feet. Uh, that's our request, and because the, we have a setback of pretty much. 70 feet from here to this to this building and I showed you the diagram which is really shows right, I understand I understand your your uh, diagram but uh, I, in the packet that was presented to the, this board I, I believe the units along the north property line were limited to 55 feet but uh, maybe I misinterpreted that for the record Jacqueline Genson uh, as part of staff's presentation 
one of the items we wanted to correct on the record that's in the staff report, the applicant is not supportive of one of the conditions in item three, which is relative to the height restriction. We are requesting a 55 foot height limitation from the northern property line um, of, sorry, from northern property line south 150 feet for a building not to exceed 55 feet. And then on the eastern side, within 118 feet east of the property boundary, we are also requesting the same 55 foot limitation. The applicant is requesting <coughs> look at it verbatim, semi presentation. Sorry, it's 55 feet in height on the north property line, 75 feet from the northern boundary, and then 35 feet from the eastern boundary. Okay, th thank you. I, I appreciate that information, and I understand then there is a deviation from what the package that we received. That is and, correct. And that the, today they're requesting additional height along the north property line. It was not part of the approval process that you went through, or not approved, not suggested to be approved. Correct. My recommendation for the height limitation is in the condition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have further clarification with the staff report. Right. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. yeah uh, ho hold on a second. Uh, that plan does not show TC5 at all. It's off to the left. Is there anything that you want to present that might happen there? I appreciate that's a different, not part of your team, but it's part of this hearing you talk about the property west of Luke Street yeah, right I, uh, off to the left edge of the pages yeah mr. Worcester, I, I'll, I'll speak to that all right so um, that property over there on the left edge TC5 um, Omer sorry Omer drawer yeah for the record so that property there on the left TC5 when this property was foreclosed it was foreclosed in three pieces uh, we initially acquired the first then we acquired where the parking garage is and that final parcel TC5 was completely separate from that um, that was an unfortunate situation the lady um, who currently represents that uh, Jeannie Umbricht is here today um, her mother sadly passed uh, recently uh, it's her mother's uh, lot and um, when this fell apart uh, the because it was originally designed as one MCP it created a very difficult situation for them because um, there were use rights for each parcel but a limit for the entire thing which meant that if you added up all the use rights it was actually greater than the limit and so when we approached the city to ask how do you resolve that it essentially there isn't no there isn't um, a precedent for that which meant it was basically first come first serve and that put them in a difficult position because while they have no intention of developing it right now um, and uh, I mean, they'd be happy to develop it but they had no intention of developing it but at the same time they also wanted to make sure that you know, they would have some rights at some point in the future. Um, the way it originally worked, we could have built out all of our commercial space and left them with nothing. And that's obviously inappropriate. So we were very, uh, very open from day one. We approached them. We said, how can we work together to make sure that now we can finally separate the two parcels and define their uses? So we worked with, uh, Jeannie went ahead and got uh, uh, representation a uh, real estate broker Andrew DeSalvo over at Premier um, and he analyzed what a normal site like that it's about two acres what would the normal uh, uses be and the normal restrictions and he figured that usually on two acres you'd normally fit somewhere around 20,000 square feet of commercial and that's how we ended up with that number where we said okay we'll designate 18,000 feet of commercial space and that really aligns with what that parcel would have had had it just been its own parcel so now they no longer are dependent on us, and their future rights are, um, are now uh, locked in. So that, that's why they joined our application. So there's no, there's no currently any plans at all for that site. It's just an empty uh, piece of land that we don't control, but at least now it'll be its own separate site. Okay, th thank you for that explanation. However, yes. well, the package we have been given yes. allows 23,000 square feet uh -huh. of commercial space and a 40 room hotel unit on that site yeah obviously all of that will not fit and is not appropriate for a two acre site 
Sure. So it's actually 18,000 feet, uh, just to correct the record. Uh, TC5 is 18,000 feet. TC1 is 5,000. So right. the altogether it's 23, but for okay. that specific site, it's 18,000 feet. Right. And the reason that the 40-room hotel exists is um, we, we didn't want to take any use rights away. So prior to this application, the, the current existing zoning for TC5 right now is 50,000 square feet of commercial space and a 40-room hotel. So in originally, when we were redoing this, in order to not take anyone's land use rights away, we were going to leave them the 50,000 feet. They graciously agreed, in order to get the fined rights, to lower that 50 down to 18. The 40 is still remaining. So this still takes the site uh, down from 50 to 18 and leaves the 40 that was there. So it's actually significantly less dense than what, it was, what it's currently zoned for. So, so it's possible at this with this application that they could put 18,000 square feet of commercial property and a 40 year 40 no. unit hotel on that TC2 site uh or no TC5 excuse me yeah so no because the application calls for it to actually fit within the development the development order has to meet all the city's requirements so and and you obviously have a lot of experience with traffic and with uh, and, and much more so than I do uh and so if 40, if 40 rooms hotel and 18,000 feet combined does not meet all of the standards that you would need to fit on that site, then they simply would not be able to do so. So they cannot build beyond what can fit on the site. Um, so yeah, they, they would not be able to do so. Right now they'd be able to do 18,000 feet and that's only if it fit on the site. And again, that is a significant reduction from what they're currently allowed. So the max use is as of today for that site is 50,000 feet of commercial and 40 rooms of hotel. I understand, but what's what's currently allowed is is frankly impossible so is to get on that feet. site. So that it's succumbed to reduce that that amount to a reasonable level. However, allowing the 40 unit hotel, which is not a small package, to also be on that site seems a little exorbitant to me. Well, again, it's not. Um, so these are just these are potential use cases, and just like you pointed out, 50,000 feet could not be built on the site. And in the same way, you're absolutely correct. 18,000 feet in a 40-room hotel could not be built. And even if it was approved today, they could not build that. They would still be restricted to what actually fits within the LDC. So I approving that today gives the options of those uses. So potentially, there's 40,000 feet. We just saw uh, a 40-room hotel on a two-acre site. We just saw the other day city council approve a 60 room hotel on a 29,000 foot site. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that the applicant can do that. And really TC5 is not, it's not something that we intend to develop. Um, and and I, I know, the, I know the, the owner of TC5, uh, wonderful, wonderful lady. Um, and I don't foresee them in any way trying to take advantage of this situation. Uh, they legitimately are just trying to maintain what would otherwise be if they had never been a part of the MPD. And I think that that's the commercial square footage. We just didn't want to take away the, the 40 unit hotel because we didn't want to take away someone's existing uses. Okay, I, I understand. I thank you for your explanation. However, yeah. is, is, is there an agreement that TC5 can use your parking garage no. to satisfy their parking requirements that may occur on lot TC5? No, there isn't. So they would have to fit their own parking, which again would limit their uses on the site. And in addition to that, our entire application is limited by 390 hotel rooms. So that means that what you're approving right now, what we're asking for and what we're showing on TC1 is 390 hotel rooms. So if that's approved and we go to development order and we go ahead and get a development order for 390 hotel rooms, it would automatically end their ability to build 40 rooms of hotel. So their 40-room hotel could not be built in addition to our 390. Okay, that's a little bit different than the way I understood the package we were presented. But thank you for your explanation. You're welcome. Okay. Eddie, uh, Mr. Donnelly has a question. Uh, Richard Donnelly, for the record, uh, uh, another parking question. If the parking expert can respond. In, in, in your calculations, did, did you uh, address uh, employee parking? If this is a resort hotel type operation there's going to be a lot of employees and then the the shuttle uh, parking area uh, were those addressed in your on the site plan correct the, the, the employees parking that we're really trying to do is pretty much close to this area that that way it eliminates 
uh, as far as the trips and so forth. That's, that's the p process of thinking to put it right about this area. The, the, sh the shuttle area will be, be pretty much in, in, in this area coming in and out. Uh, and uh, the, the hotel parking will, will be shuttling back and forth or with carts and so forth might be that from the parking structure. And how many, how many employees are you figuring uh, park there? I mean, it, again, we, we talked about that there's going to be a the, the, the lot of employees. I'm not sure exactly how many employees that we're going to have, but that's, again, part of the DO process that we will go through seeing the size of the buildings and, and, the, and the amenities and those type of things. So, Thank you. But as far as parking, there is a sufficient, and we can locate it pretty much uh, in, in different areas for residential area and so forth and the hotel and, and the staff. We have different Thank options. Thanks. Mr. Inserpi? Yeah, I don't know if I've... For the record. I, for the record, Bob Inserpi, I don't know if I should address this to you, Ms. Montgomery, or to Tom Tretch. A couple of questions. If this gets approved, when do you intend to break ground? That, that's an Amer question. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, our intent is to pre-sell this season. In, and one issue is uh, timing, obviously. Uh, we expect to get our zoning board approvals September 19th. And if we do so, we believe that we can still make it into season this season to start doing pre-sales on our condominiums. Um, that's really key for us because we do want some velocity in our pre-sales before we break, break ground. So if we can get our zoning board approvals by uh, the end of September, we can still do some pre-sales this season, which would allow us to break ground after season. And that's also dependent on the development order. Um, you know, we didn't expect the application to take a year and a half, and so while I'm very hopeful of the development order process, um, you know, we, we obviously aren't breaking ground until we get that done. Uh, right now, if everything falls smoothly, we would be able to potentially break ground next summer. Next summer? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now Mr. Tresh would like to ask him something, please. Thank you. Ted. Ted Trush. Yes. Just explain something to me if you can. If they are going to break ground next summer, okay, how is that the construction, how is that going to impact Benita Beach Road? Because every summer there's a little bit more traffic on a beach road. How is that going to impact Benita Beach Road? And how is that going to impact Luke's Street? The construction traffic? Uh huh. Well, that's something we typically don't look at in terms of our analysis right. because the construction traffic is much less than the traffic that the project will ultimately generate uh, at full build out. Although it's, it's a different type of traffic, you've got trucks, semi trucks, but that's part of the whole development order process. You know, how they'll get construction traffic into and out of the project. The city will look at. Uh, you know, Luke Street and the condition of that street prior to construction beginning. So that, that all, the whole process is evaluated during the time of, of development order. The traffic analysis we look at is really at the full build out. We don't really concentrate on the issues during the construction itself because it, it changes, it modifies. They may use the Bonita Beach access right. at one time, then they may move and use the Meadow Lark access and you move the depending on how this construction phasing is, it's all, <laughs> it's all very fluid in terms of how they build the project. Since there's existing units on the project, I would anticipate most of the construction traffic would not be on Luke Street just because there's already existing units. But that's obviously that's to be determined when the construction plans are drawn up. And okay, with your expertise, Ted, I don't want to put you on the spot. Go, that's fine. Do you think that Luke Street, Meadowlark, and Benita Beach Road can handle heavy truck traffic above and beyond what we've got already on the, on the road? Bonita Beach by far, yes. I mean, it was designed and, and that, that roadway is designed to accommodate that traffic. The, the side streets, uh, again, we're only talking about construction traffic limited to these short segments of, uh, here's Metal Arc over here on the wall, but there's an access right here. So. Again, this will all be evaluated at the time of development order, the pavement conditions of these streets, and perhaps prior to construction beginning, they may have to do some pavement uh, additions uh, to accommodate the construction traffic. And then once, obviously, you don't want to do your final pavement 
prior to construction because you don't want your construction traffic obviously tearing up the road but then once construction's done then they come back in and put the final lift and do all their final road improvements to make it look nice and uh, take care of all but we're literally only talking about a few several hundred feet of roadway that the construction traffic would be and again it may be possible to utilize this driveway obviously this driveway is shared with a restaurant so that has to be taken into consideration as well the, the county DOT has been willing in the past to, to maybe approve a temporary construction access uh, directly onto Benito Beach Road. That's all things that we can look at during the process. There will be no construction traffic on the back road of the uh, development, right? Am I correct? Quail's West, you talk about that. Quail, whatever. Is whatever, back Quail something. Yeah. Well, this, well, back no here? Access. Right. I, I wouldn't anticipate. No. No. Okay. Thank okay. you, Ted. Appreciate Thank it. You. Mr. Chairman, I have one more quick, quick one for Ted. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we know that Luke Street, north of our project, this project, is one lane. In each direction, yes. Now, Luke Street is north of this project. North, yes, you're right. Is correct. one lane that, only. That's correct. And currently, in season, I would like to suggest that a lot of people use that to get up to Quail's, Quail's Walk and go east to Windsor Road to bypass the, the congestion on Bonita Beach Road. It's a, it's a bypass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything planned in this development to address that dangerous situation of the one lane road had capable, legally capable of handling two lanes of traffic or two directional track? Right. Is there any discussion about that Relative to your proposal, sure. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> Ted, Ted's not aware of the um, and any plans to uh, Luke Street uh, because he does our traffic analysis. Okay. Um, so I could speak to that question. Um, yes, we've spoken to staff uh, quite a bit about our willingness to uh, invest and pay for privately any improvements to Luke Street. Uh, Luke Street is a, uh, I think uh, again a dilapidated road. It, it's odd road where it's a two-way road, but it's actually only wide enough for a single lane. Um, we've indicated our willingness to invest to go ahead and improve Luke Street, to widen Luke Street um, for the residents in the back. Um, I, I know that the city is looking at their visioning study to make that Vanderbilt Beach, uh, Benita Beach Road uh, intersection a roundabout and, and to utilize it as a uh, parallel road. I also know that uh, some of the residents on Luke Street, uh, on, on Quails Walk, would prefer for that not to be the case. They'd rather that parallelness start maybe another street forward so that they don't have uh, that traffic. We're certainly not sending any of our traffic back there. Um, and, but we, we, are, we are willing to go ahead and do the improvements to Luke Street. Um, so any improvements that are necessary. And a part of our application on page one was that if, uh, that we would pay, one thing we'd like to do is actually use uh, bricks. Uh, brick pavers on Luke Street and actually widen the street. Um, and we're even in discussions now with potentially acquiring the parcel across the street. Uh, and then we can go ahead and give some additional land into Luke Street to even widen it more. Um, but yeah, what we'd be happy to pay for that. We've met, we've met, uh, said that many times. Okay, you get into the drainage ditch to the west, of course. Yes, yes. Which yeah. would be very expensive to go to the west. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question uh, on traffic. Uh, Richard Donnelly for the record uh, the issue of the shuttles I guess in the, the proposal is for four shuttles do you feel that they're going to be ac adequate to serve the needs when the when the, uh, when the hotel is up functioning you've got maybe 700 people who want to go out to dinner at the same time uh, how <laughs> how is that uh, are we going to need four or are we going to need 14 yeah actually um, so four was uh, if you noticed when Neil mentioned earlier that we, uh, our, our desire was have to have shuttle service mandated and we're happy to have it mandated at higher than four. Um, actually our intent right now is to have eight shuttles to start when the project is completed and see the level of service. The reason the number four came in there, um, in discussions with staff, it appears that it would, it's going to be very difficult um, to monitor that for the city staff. Um, so the actual number that we put in was an absolute minimum that we felt would be very easy to monitor because we'd always be able to guarantee. Uh, they had some concerns about 
you know, what happens if a shuttle is down for the week or, if, you know, if, if a shuttle has a transmission problem, um, any issues like that where they'd have to come out and kind of monitor and make sure that, so the idea was that the mandatory minimum would be um, low enough where if we have eight shuttles at any given time, four would be operating. Um, but our intent is to have eight shuttles. And we're happy to have any, any conditions that involve uh, man, uh, making the shuttle service mandatory or increasing the number of shuttles, we're completely open to. And we're happy to do, because we intend on uh, going above and beyond on that side anyway. Yeah. And that's for let, our Let me just address residents. that from a condition standpoint. Condition 12. Oh, hang on, sorry. That's B. Omer Dror for the record. Yeah, so I'm sorry. This is Neil Montgomery for the record. Uh, condition 12B says, should the applicant pursue the shuttle service alternative uh, the service times, method, manner, and mode shall be as prescribed in the shuttle service study. So the way it's designed now, it says at the time of local development or the applicant may request um, the shuttle service and the shuttle study. So, so to your point, the number of shuttles, I'm assuming, and I'm sure Jackie will clarify, is going to be established through the study that the staff is going to review and approve that 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 would be my understanding of how that would work okay anything else uh, if not uh, we'll take uh, some public comment at this time on your presentation no oh, oh staff first right okay if we have to can we uh, take a uh, I've got request on either side of me for a 10 minute break before staff May we do that? We take a 10 minute break.